Welcome to Wine Line Radio. This is your host, Robert Scott, and today we're talking with Andrew Chalk. Now, Andrew is a Dallas-based author who writes about wine, spirits, beer, food, restaurants, wineries, and destinations all over the world. His uh, articles have appeared in the Daily Meal, John Mariani's Virtual Gourmet, Psalm Journal, WineSearcher.com, and many other publications. Good morning, Andrew. Okay, good. I, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, well, good. So, uh, folks, uh, Andrew is uh, talking to us as he drives around the... Are you in the Texas Hill Country? Yes, yes I'm actually just, just leaving Austin. Oh, really? Okay, love Austin. Uh, love the Texas wines as well. That's right. That's right. Well, let's talk a little bit about Texas wines. Give us... Uh, some background and uh, tell us what uh, you're doing today uh, as you drive away from Austin. Sure. It might be most helpful to your listeners if I explain how I got into the subject of Texas wine, because obviously wine comes from all over the world, and you might ask the question, well, you know, why Texas wine? Well, what happened was I was a writer, um, and I was writing back in 2009, and um, essentially, um, I um, had heard of Texas wine, and I had Texas wine before then, and um, I had then found anything very compelling. In fact, I found a fair amount of pretty bad winemaking. And then one day, I was at a tasting with a friend. He kidnapped me, stuffed me in the back of his Lexus SUV, and took me a few hundred yards to an industrial unit in the design district in Dallas, and on the front was the name Inwood Estates Winery. It looked about as much like a winery as a post office. Looks like a headquarters of NASA. And um, we, he took me in. Behind the counter was this tall, um, uh, tall man serving two wines. One was well known to wine lovers. It was Bodegas Muga uh, Rioja Reserva, which is a Spanish red wine made from the Tempranillo grape. It costs about, for the reserve, probably about 80 to $90. And Muga is an old-established, well-respected wine house. Uh, probably then, my favorite yeah. uh, Spanish wine. Yeah, it was uh, it is, it is very popular and uh, very good wine. Next to it was a wine I'd never heard of before, but it was from this winery, Inwood Estates Vineyards. And it was, he explained, a Tempranillo from Texas. And the way that he put his products out there for people to try was to do a direct head-to-head -head comparison of the two wines next to each other at the same time at tastings at the tasting room with him there, the winemaker and founder, to answer questions. It, it was a pretty compelling demonstration because he was, he's really, he was right out there, as it were. So I tasted the two. And first of all, they're not the same. Obviously, Rioja has its own character. Uh, Texas, would, I was to discover, would have its own character. But they were both really enjoyable examples of Tempranillo. Both were wines that would age. Both were wines that you'd really enjoy with beef or lamb or some other kind of red meat dish. And at that point, I realized, hang on, there is some good wine being made here. And in some research over the next few weeks, I discovered that there was a subset of wineries in Texas who were doing what great winemakers are doing all over the world, which was they were totally committed to quality, totally committed to using Texas grapes. And they were trying to make the best wine in the world with the, with the resources, including the knowledge that they had. And sometimes they succeeded, sometimes they failed. But what I found since that time, and now it's been almost a decade since, the, since that 2009 fateful meeting, what I found is that the quality has undoubtedly got better and better every year. Well, that's uh, nice to hear. I have only made one trip to uh, Texas wine country a few years ago. Uh, went to a winery that is producing... Uh, all Italian uh, varietals, and I was really impressed with it. Uh, and as you say, they really had a commitment to excellence and trying to develop products that uh, 
were competitive in the uh, wide world of uh, wine. Yeah, um, and I, I, the um, Italian varieties like Sangiovese, um, Montepulciano, Trebbiano, and um, Sangrantino are coming in as um, uh, as coming in as uh, as very successful varieties in the state. And the number of wineries that are making wines out of Italian varieties is increasing. Well, that's that's really interesting that you uh, uh, mentioned Sagrantino. Uh, it is one of my favorite wines, a wine not many people know about. Uh, spent uh, a good deal of time in Montefalco in Umbria uh, at the uh, uh, annual uh, Sagrantino Wine Festival with and have good friends in uh, in that area and just knocked out with the wine and I'm happy to see some wineries starting to use that varietal here in the States. Yeah, it's slowly catching on. If you're, uh, I love the uh, Umbria as well and if you're in Texas and you wanted to try one, I uh, think you can now get it actually out of the state as well. I've been in certain markets like New York. Uh, the winery called Messina Hof actually has their own plantings and they're producing the Sagrantino and I expect other wineries will start producing it too. Wow, it's amazing. It might be helpful um, if I talk about how this, how the industry looks now, kind of wind forward from 2009 to 2018. Well, that would be great. That would give us uh, a broader perspective on uh, Texas wine. So go right ahead, Andy. Okay. The, um, basically, if you look at a map of Texas and put it on top of Western Europe, it encompasses the area of several countries. Um, it's huge. So there isn't one microclimate or anything, anything like that. There's, there's essentially multiple climates, multiple soils, and therefore, when we talk about Texas wine, we should really talk about um, wine in smaller areas. Um, the basic layout of the industry in Texas is that you grow your grapes in the area called the Panhandle. So if you were looking at a map of Texas, the Panhandle is the part that points up towards Kansas out in the western section of the state. The largest town there is called Lubbock. It's overwhelmingly agricultural. Traditionally, it's been cotton, sorghum, and now the what what, what's happening is more and more farmers are switching to grapes because they are finding that they're that they're running up against water limits from the aquifer that feeds the area, and grapes use about a quarter of the water that cotton uses. What that means is that we have people who are coming to farm grapes who are already expert farmers. So we're getting great crops very quickly. There's a very short learning curve as these farmers simply transition from one crop to another, as they, you know, as they their families have done for generations. Um, so the hill cut, so the, um, the High Plains, which has got an AVA status, is an American viticultural area, the uh, Texas High Plains AVA. It's the second largest AVA in the state. It's over 8 million acres in total, with about 4,500 planted uh, acres and over 35 grape varieties. Um, that's where you grow your grapes. And as to what grapes, right now, I would say the industry is so young that we are still in the experimental stage. And that's one reason why there are so many different grapes. We're still trying to find out what grapes grow best, how to adjust for the idiosyncrasies of particular grapes. Um, and so you can find everything from a Chardonnay to an Alberino to, as I mentioned, a Montepulciano, a Zinfandel. There's even some brave people making Pinot Noir, which up until last year was a, a grape variety that I found that always done poorly in the state, but that may be about to change as well. The other area that's huge in terms of the Texas wine industry is called the Texas Hill Country. This is the area that's much better known. It's the area you've been to. It's the area where I am now. And this is the uh, largest AVA in the state. That there's Basically, San Antonio uh, is to the south. Austin is to the east. Uh, Central Texas is to the west, 
and to the north, so about three hours north, you've got the metropolises of Dallas and Fort Worth. So the hill country has become essentially, I call it, the state's showroom. This is where, if you started a winery, you would buy your grapes from the High Plains, as I said. You would put your winery in the hill country. This is where your visitors come from. You've got uh, Austin, 30 minutes. Uh, San Antonio, 45 minutes. Houston, about four hours. Dallas, about three and a half to four hours. So, um, it, it, and, and you've got an international airport in Austin and also another airport in San Antonio. So this is where people come to taste Texas wine. And in fact, they've even established a wine trail that's become so popular, it's the second busiest in the country after Highway 29 in Napa. Wow. And in, in the area, there's a total of about 60 wineries who are members of the Texas Hill Country Wineries Association. Uh, they have their own website. That's where all the quality wineries and growers are members. And you can find the list and basically set up. They have maps there. You can set up your tour and you know do a whole vacation, probably staying in the, in the lovely Victorian town of Fredericksburg, which is where I'm staying this, this long weekend. And um, using either a, a, um, a chauffeur service or a designated driver to drive around and taste of the various wineries. Good for you. <laughs> uh, that's a, really a huge AVA. It's very expansive. It is. It's nine million acres. It's even bigger than the one out in the in the High Plains. It's the biggest in the state. It's amazing. Well, it's you know, and parallel. Uh, Wise, what does it match up with uh, with Europe? Do you know? Uh, sorry, what does it match up with? Uh, uh, as far as as like, far as uh, the uh, latitude, yeah. that, that that's a good question. We've looked at uh, we've had sessions at the state conferences about that on wine, and basically, if you took Spain, um, Texas, most of the growing is on a latitude from southern Spain to North Africa. So from that, you might conclude, wow, it's much too hot. In fact, it would be presumptuous to jump to that conclusion. And the reason is the following, that um, the high plains, you know, think of Texas as flat. You think of Texas as hot. You think of Texas as being much like New Orleans down in the southeast, where on the Gulf Coast, you've got high humidity as well as high heat. If you go out to Lubbock, you are at... Um, between, depending on where you are, you're between two and a half and four thousand feet above sea level. So you've got altitude. You're actually at altitudes that will be regarded as, as mountain altitudes um, in uh, many areas of the world. Um, you've got humidity that is almost zero. We're talking about humidities of three to five percent. So you you you've got. Um, a very low disease pressure on the grapes because of the lack of humidity, meaning that things like mildew and so forth um, are essentially non-existent. Um, we're not troubled there by things like, excuse me, we're not troubled by things like uh, the sharpshooters that are responsible for Pierce's disease, although Pierce's disease is a big problem down in the southeast of the, of, of the state, and we're working closely with growers in California to tackle that. Um, so basically, the grapes are being grown in an area that, although it's at the same out, uh, latitude as North Africa, has a much different climate. Well, I'm, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I'm just trying to pull up a uh, uh, world map here as we uh, talk, and <coughs> looking across uh, from North Africa. <coughs> Uh, and Spain, uh, that brings us right across uh, parts of uh, Spain, Italy, uh, Bulgaria, Turkey, where uh, some excellent uh, wines are being made today. Yeah, and we can even grow um, cool, cool climate varieties with very careful viticulture. A case in point would be, have you ever had a Chardonnay that from the appellation known as the city of Dallas. No, I have not. 
<laughs> you, that puts you with 99.99% of the world. There is a vineyard that a guy put in his backyard. This is the guy behind Inwood Estates Vineyards, Dan Gatlin, the guy I mentioned before. He put it in his backyard in um, on Inwood Road in Dallas, which is a, a major thoroughfare that goes from downtown up to, uh, out to the northern suburbs. He planted an a, a experimental vineyard and still gets Chardonnay grapes from it, with a um, uh, with, which he uses to make a very small appellation, um, City of Dallas <laughs> Chardonnay, and you will be absolutely blown away, because far from being some kind of curiosity that you give to people that, you, that you're never going to see again as a present, <laughs> it is... It is the, the, in many ways the spinning image of a, of a Grand Cru Chablis. It's very crisp. It's very dry. It has great body weight because of the fact we get so much more, so many more sun hours than you get in Burgundy. But it's a really a testament to good winemaking over overpowering the difference between the Appalachians of of uh, Burgundy and uh, and North Texas. Does it see any oak? It does. He uses only French oak when he uses oak. He uses oak in with you know, carefully in his more expensive wines. And that one, that the output's so small, it's become well enough known that there are people who just say, send me a case, uh, even though the, the, the wine now is probably over $70 a bottle. And uh, it's it's got just enough oak. It's like a... Grand Cru Burgundy, in the sense it has just enough oak to, or a kiss of oak, I guess is the term, to uh, give it oak character, without the oak being a powerful part of the complexion. It's not a, it's not a new, a, a new world, um, heavily oaked, um, oak fermented, least stirred monster or anything of yeah, that sort. I, I hate the oak monster when it comes to uh, Chardonnay. I think that the, <laughs> generally, generally the uh, European expression of uh, Chardonnay is is much finer than uh, than some that we uh, see from areas yeah, in I, uh, California. I, I think, you know, there is actually I actually like some, sometimes I like say that something like lobster. I like one of those New World monster Chardonnays. Um, it's a style I think you know is is, is very um, very appealing in in, in moderation. And um, there is a winery. Using a hill hill country vineyard, Sertenberg Vineyards, the Sertenberg Vineyard, uh, that's making a California style monster Chardonnay. The, the winery is called Fall Creek. Um, they're one of the oldest wineries in the state, and their Sertenberg Vineyard Chardonnay is a great wine to put into a blind tasting with some California Chardonnays to see if anybody says, hmm, wine number five is very different from all the others. Because invariably they don't. It fits right in. And if you rank the wines, you'll find people, you know, probably rank it, uh, uh, you know, halfway or more uh, near, near the top. In other words, it doesn't give up anything in terms of quality. And I think that's in large part because of the, the, the very, they're very careful growing the grapes at the Sertenberg Vineyards. And the winemaker for Fall Creek, uh, who came there in 2013, is, the for, is a former winemaker at Concha y Toro, mm -hmm. which is the largest winery in Chile, where he was responsible for everything from supermarket-type wines through to some of their named vineyards, you know, the Puente-type wines and so forth. So, he's, in other words, he was a Texas winery that went out into the global labor market when they needed to hire a winemaker. And he's, he's producing some really stellar wines at Four Creek Vineyards. That's great. And if you're having it with lobster, as you say, you can, uh, if you drink enough of it, you can uh, cut out the butter. That's right. Yes, <laughs> you can indeed. It's a health <laughs> product. It is. I, I try to good wine. <laughs> That's great. Well, I appreciate uh, all the uh, information you've given us on Texas wineries. It's uh, uh, an education for sure. And I'll just briefly uh, ask you about your uh, other favorite activity, which is soccer. 
Yes. Yes, and as uh, you may know, we in Orlando have uh, uh, are entering our second year in the uh, MLS. Uh, yeah. And I think with, that's great. Yeah, we've got a great new stadium here, and it looks like we've made some dandy acquisitions for this upcoming season. It does. I, I think it's great that, that both, you know, the city of Orlando and the MLS is expanding. Um, it, what's happening in the professional game reflects what's going on in the on sort of pl uh, playing fields up and down the country where lots of those people who learned soccer at school as kids stay with it so they become become um, you know adult men or adult women and they and they they go into adult leagues and continue playing and uh, I enjoy playing every weekend um, and I enjoy watching the professional game obviously I like uh, the, the our, our team in Dallas to uh, uh, to uh, to win, but you know you can't have everything. Yeah, <laughs> well, we feel the same way after last season. Yeah, Andy, thank you so much. It's uh, it's been a real education. We'll look forward to continuing this uh, discussion in the uh, next uh, little bit of time as it passes. And uh, folks, that's uh, Andrew Chalk speaking from his. Uh, automobile as he blindly drives through the Texas Hill Country. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Man. Oh, it's my pleasure, Andrew.